We've been in existence since 1881. We are every year in the U.S. New, uh, US College of U.S. News and World Reports. You saw that on the video. Uh, top 20 liberal arts colleges, uh, top 10 best value for your dollar, top five in cultural and ethnic diversity. So we're, every year we are in U.S. News and World Reports. So that is a, a stellar accomplishment. Our education program has just received accreditation by CAEP. CAEP, which is the most prestigious accrediting body of an educational program, CAPE. So you can CAEP was the old NCAPE. I'm sure some of you may have heard of NCAPE and CATE. Because people call up and say, do you have NCAPE accreditation? So this is CAPE, which is the new NCAPE, uh, much more selective. So we do have accreditation. Plus the college was just reaccredited for another 10 years by Middle State. So we don't plan to go anywhere. So we're in Lower Westchester County. Uh, if you look at the schedule, you'll see that there is one course that you have to take on campus, and it will say in the fall of 2020, if you look at EDU 557, there's a course for one week in July, Monday to Friday. That is your on-campus course. New York State has what is known as a residency requirement, meaning if you do a, a degree granting program, off of the main campus, one course must be taken on the main campus. So we're giving you about a year and two months notice. Now that's, that's well in advance of when you have to be there. So if you want to use vacation time or just take the time off from work. So the week is there, it's, I think it's July 13th to the 17th of 2020. That's the only on-campus course you'll be taking. And of course, I've had people with current and previous cohorts that say, I can't make the on-campus course, I can't get that week off from work. We'll work something else out with you, maybe at a different time during the program, okay? Now we will monitor your progress through the program because you'll be following this exact sequence of courses as a group, as a cohort. All right, we'll probably be splitting you up into two sections, early childhood and childhood. And I think the schedule you have in front of you is the early childhood, correct? There are only, I believe, two or three courses that are different, but it's still the same sequence, okay? Uh, EDU 502, 528. When you get to EDU 555, the fourth course, those of you that are in childhood will be just taking EDU 554, which is the one through six course. You're at the site office, St. Francis College, two blocks over on Remsen Street. We use St. Joseph's High School, about a six minute walk on Willoughby Street. We've used Bishop Lachlan High School, which is down on uh, Claremont. And now we're even using the SCIU building on Elm Place. So we use different locations, but everything's, I would say, no more than a 10 minute walk max from this particular area right here. Now, if you look at the schedule, there is one course on our main campus. Has anyone heard of Concordia College New York? GRE. GRE! Oh my god, <laughs> the most important thing. So a GRE test. Um, for the test, we look for about a 150 score. The GRE really weighs in if your GPA from your bachelor's degree is under a 3.0. That's when we really look at the GRE to see you know, what's been the difference academically. Maybe you got your bachelor's 10 years ago and you didn't do well. You might take the GRE today and ace it and do great. So that's what we're looking for, to see if there's a change, difference in education, or just, you know, sometimes you just mature just do better in life. So, yeah. You, you took it with Cheryl and passed the first time, right? Mm -hmm. So you found her extremely helpful. Yeah. How many did you go to with her? How many sessions? Um, Two or three? Three. Okay, good. Yeah. So you just did the, the three, three sessions in the one month? Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Very She's very, very good. She's a literacy professor, so she goes through the entire exam with you step by step. She has mock exams and everything, so congratulations because you're going for two teacher certification levels. So you need this content specialty multi-subject for your general ed, and there's a content specialty students with disabilities for your special ed. And the last exam, does anyone know what it is? NTPA, NTPA right, that really gets a lot of groans. The NTPA, our courses are more and more addressing the NTPA components and giving you a foundation about the NTPA. So by the time you get to your student teaching semester, you'll have a good knowledge about what the NTPA consists of. Because you will be working on your NTPA during your student teaching semester. You'll be filming 
and you'll be going over the different tasks and exactly how to address them and be successful in the NTPA. So basically the student teaching seminar course in your last semester was technically what we unofficially call the NTPA course. Okay? So that would be done in your last semester. And again, our courses, every semester we insert more and more uh, test prep uh, course components addressing different exams. We're adding it each semester more and more. So by the time you get to each exam, you'll have a basic idea of, all right, this is a EAS. I, we learned part of this in this course, or the content specialty students with disabilities. Oh, we learned a little part about this in our autism course, okay? So we will be giving more good, well-rounded knowledge by the time you get to each exam. You'll know kind of what they were about. And there's one more workshop you need to get certified in the special ed part, and it's an autism workshop. But when you take the on-campus course, EDU 557, the autism workshop is part of that course. So you do not have to worry about going out and finding an autism workshop, it's embedded in that course. Let's talk about field work. All courses have certain field work hours, whether it be five, 10, or 15 hours, 15 is max. You need to go into a classroom and do some observations, you may have a case study in one of your courses, that would account for your field work hours. You may have to interview a parent or a child of a parent with uh, special needs. Child of a parent, I'm sorry, a child. A parent of a child with special needs. You have a minimum of 40 full-time pay days or 80 part-time pay days in a grade range of the program you're enrolled in. We can waive half of your student teaching hours. Now you're only doing 180 hours instead of 360. And once you, uh, we get that waiver approved, we also take three credits off your program. Now your student teaching semester has gone from a six credit course to a three credit course. So you save half your hours and you, did, you get a three credit reduction in the program. Okay, so you're saving hours and money. Mm -hmm. So what if I'm not working in the evening? Okay. What's that? What if I'm not working in the evening? Okay, are you looking to come into birth to two or grades one through six? And are you working in the school now? No, at high school. In a high school. Okay, so by the time you get to your student teaching semester, if you're looking to come into birth to grade two, you will but without a doubt have to do your student teaching in a birth to grade two. I mean, you may have to take a leave or maybe you can do an after school program. So do you have any paid experience in birth to grade two at all in your yeah. past history? Yeah. Reason within five years? Yeah. Birth to two. Mm -hmm. So that would get half your hours waived. So that means you'll only have to do 180 hours in a birth to two. I have had people that are working in other fields or other grade ranges that have either done it in an after-school program, someone's done it over the summer, uh, we've had people actually do it in bits and pieces during lunch hours or after their school day, so we'll help you find something to get in. We've had a lot of our students become hired by schools in the DOE just based on their internship certificate as lead teachers. One of our professors Dr. Shannon Burton is a principal. Has anyone heard of the Roslyn Yallo Charter School up in the Bronx? It's, I think it's 166th Street. He's a principal. And last year alone, he hired six of our site students mm -hmm. with the internships and because He's looking to hire four more this school year coming in September. So again, you have the program completed, the DASA workshop at your fingerprints. Boom, you've got your certificate. One of your certifications issued is a conditional certification. In your teacher account, it will say it's good for two years. It actually expires as soon as you finish our program. So if you look at the New York State website, it says valid for two years or until the student completes or leaves the program. So technically, once you, it's only good while you're in the program, but again, it's good to get people hired with that information. The higher over a 3.0, your GPA is 3.0 or higher. Uh, the less important your GRE scores really are where they really come into play for someone under a 3 -0 coming in as a condition. There's another thing I want to bring up. If anybody did their undergraduate degree outside of the U.S., with the exception of Puerto Rico and Canada, uh, we do need evaluations from either WES or GLOBE or some kind of a evaluator credential service. All right? Only for the transcripts out of the U.S., with the exception of Puerto Rico and Canada. Okay. Mine as well. Um, it's kind of like a checkbox thing, and as you submit things, you hit save, and that should kind of tell you what's going on gradually. But it does get to a point where, like, your recommendation letters, they sometimes will randomly come in, and you have no idea if they're in or not. So you can always reach out to us in admissions, and we can check that.
All right, so reach out to me, you have my card, and what I do is I always copy Zanzia on the reply. I'll ask you if you want to upload the letter, so if you don't have it on you to upload, the other option is to put their email address in. Right. And what happens is the system sends an invite email to them saying, this person has asked for a recommendation letter from you, please, <laughs> blah, 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 and then it sends through them, so that they send me the letter through your application. Oh, so we don't reach out to into, them. No, yeah, but then no, I notice that the right, they get an email from the system. Yes, that's just inviting them to upload. Yeah, it's a system if generated. If they don't do it, they don't fill it in. But they, let's say they've already sent it directly to me. You can upload it, and if the uploading is giving you a hard time, you can email address. Okay. And then she'll upload it may. Right. Maybe so often there's a glitch. Somebody may not be able to get there. The recommender maybe did not get the email, or the recommender wasn't sure how to do it. You can always send the letters to me, and then I'll forward the right to Zanti. To talk to you about the EAS workshop, we I conducted on Thursday evenings, 5.30 to 7.30, and Sundays all day from 9 to 3, but it's from 9 to 11, one session, 11 to 1, another session, and 1 to 3, a third session. And pretty much we go over strategies that will help you be successful with the EAS exam. Um, writing strategies and multiple choice strategies as a system today. Um, pretty much some of you may be familiar with that if you're in the field of education. They write multiple choice questions in a particular way. And we work it out where you're pretty successful with it. Thea is living proof. This is great. I'm so glad she's here. And. Um, it's definitely at your leisure because you, I know you're very busy with your coursework and work and family and things of that nature. It's at your leisure. Um, it's two hours, but I strongly suggest you put aside some time for it. You are now charged with passing five exams, so you might as well get started. EAS is, the, I believe, the simplest exam, um, and it's based on classroom. Experience. So you're welcome. I look forward to seeing you. I'm sure I will see you all, unless you're just, you know, this magnificent individual going to go in there, take it on that one shot. Is the, EI, the EAS exam, does that replace the ATSW? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. However, I, I don't believe they are grandfathering anyone on that ATSW. Mm -hmm. uh, so mostly everyone will be required to take it, unfortunately. But um, it's the simplest exam, and, and I'm sure you'll be successful, quite successful. And I recommend that you come for the first three ses sessions, and uh, depending on how you feel, come back for the second, because we really get into practice during the second session. Okay, the first session, we're going over strategies and things of that nature. Okay, and the information, because it's divided in five uh, subsets, and we go over that information. And the second session is where we really get into the practice to see if you're ready to go. Okay? And especially if you test. You have the multi-subject, and it's broken up into the grade range of your program. So they have the multi-subject for teachers of early childhood and childhood. So if I've already taken that, I wouldn't have to take Do it Do you again. take this multi-subject already? So all three parts, liberal arts and science, English, language, arts, and math, all three parts? I'm going to be honest. I took a lot of these things years ago. Okay. So I, I can't really tell you. All right, exactly. what I would do is you have a teach account, right? Yes. I go in and see which ones you've taken and pass and email me, and I'll let you know exactly what you have to do. All right. Does anyone not have a teach account with the state, T-E-A-C-H? Everyone has a teach account? Not you. <laughs> <laughs> because whenever you take an exam or a workshop, your scores go into your teach account. Whenever we recommend you for something, we recommend you through your teach account. Whenever you apply for something, you apply through your teach account. So it's it's mandatory, it's vital to have a teach account. And everybody here does, so we're in good shape. So again, how many of you are considering starting in July? How many are thinking about October? See, that's good. I don't want you to feel pressured. There's no rush. You start when you feel ready. Essay. 300 words, why you're applying to the program. What is your philosophy of education? A current resume and the contact information of your two recommenders. Once you put those four items in, your application will say, 
a 100% successful study as soon as you can in. Get it in as soon as you can because we can get you a decision, a decision quicker even for October. Because a lot of people like to know right away so they can start planning their, their life, what they have to do around their master's degree study. So we'll give you uh, an idea even for the October cohort pretty quickly once everything comes in. For the term, fall 19, that, that's the term you guys are applying for, whether you're July or October, it's still fall 19. Our financial aid office takes EIP scholarships and they also work with you with the teach grant. So there are a lot of ways to cut down the cost of your education as well. Okay? And that's basically what we have to say for tonight. And again, questions, if anybody wants to speak to me quickly after, you know, feel free. And we hope to see your application in the system within the next five minutes. <laughs>